I'm John Travis in Novato, California on April Fool's Day 2020, talking to Polly McCabe, where it's already April 22nd. In, uh, a second, yes, 22nd, wow, <laughs> leaping ahead uh, in uh, south of Melbourne in um, Victoria. And the town again, the name? St. Leonard's. St. Leonard's, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, where they filmed uh, uh, Sea Change, wasn't it, around there? They did, apparently, yeah, parts of it. They filmed it in a few different towns, but yeah, I think a lot of it was here. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's a lovely coastal area. So we have known each other for, what, about 10, 12 years, I think, through teaching. Yeah, it the, must be. I think it was about 2007 I started at, at RMIT, and you yeah. came on board shortly after that, I think. Right. So we, we go back a ways. And and we do, yeah. Uh, as another pioneer in wellness going way back to your days in Nimbin, that's where I want to start with your wellness career. But before that, let's go back to, you know, what shaped you, who you are and why, and uh, where you were born and siblings and birth order and playing nurse as a baby, uh, as a kid. Or, you know, what, what were your early uh, days like? Well, um, my parents were both um, UK people, mum from Wales and dad from England, but he had Irish ancestry. They came out as children, you know, quite young with their families, um, separately from each other, um, in the 1920s. Hmm. And so it was post-war, mum's dad was a First World War survivor, soldier, um, and... Dad's parents were in the weaving trade in Manchester and for various reasons their families decided to emigrate and um, uh, eventually mum and dad met but they were both working in a factory in, um, in Melbourne in uh, a, a weaving factory making towels and sheets and things like that I think and mum worked at a loom and dad was a loom tuner. His dad was very intelligent and mechanically minded too. He, you know, he could have been, you know, a great engineer or anything really, but they just didn't have the education opportunities in those days. So anyway, they met there, they married. Um, our mum was 20 and dad was 26 and I came along six years later. Mm. As the, the first. Uh -huh. Sorry? You were the oldest then? I was the first and then um, uh, four years later came my sister Vicky and she, so it was just the two of us, yeah, we grew up and uh, dad got asthma so he couldn't stay in the in the um, weaving industry because of the, all the particles in the air so he bought a, a little milk bar in Albert Park which was a sort of bayside suburb of Melbourne and we were there until I was five and then the supermarket era came in and uh, so dad said we'll, we'll go out to the country and buy a general store in the country so that's what we did and we went to Sunbury which is about a half hour drive from Melbourne. Um, it was a little country town then of about 2,000 people and um, that lasted 10 years and then one of the other general stores in the town became a supermarket. So all our customers just left overnight because mm. the novelty of the supermarket was mm. such a great lure. So anyway, um, couldn't sell the shop in those circumstances. So dad went out and got a job uh, as a, you know, a storeman or something like that in a, somewhere. And um, they just let, ran the shop. They just stopped buying stock and ran it down until there was virtually nothing left. Luckily, they were renting, so they didn't own the premises. But the premises were fabulous because it was a big old two-storey bluestone Gold Rush era hotel originally, mm -hmm. you know, on the main intersection of the town in Sunbury, you know, opposite the post office and, uh, and another hotel. And there are really old pictures of it um, in the horse and buggy days. It was on the road from Melbourne to Bendigo, which was the gold rush. You know, it was built in the kind of the gold rush era. So anyway, um, we grew up in this big rambling old hotel, Vicky and I, and it was lovely. And I had we had horses and pets, you know, dogs and birds and everything. And it was a, a beautiful childhood. So you lived upstairs yeah. over the store? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah. And the walls were about two feet thick. So, you know, in the summer when it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, it would be like 75 to 80 in, you know, on the ground floor mm -hmm. of this building. It was so, it was so cool in there. 
so anyway, we left there when I was about 15 or 16 and um, I was fed up with school. You know, I was smart, but, and I was always top or second in my grade, but I had no ambition to go to university because nobody else ever had it. Didn't, I didn't even know what it meant. And I remember mum saying to me one day, oh, well, we would have sent you to university if you were a boy, but you're a girl and you'll just get married. And, you know, that was their reality. And yeah. um, they, they didn't, you know, I think we, I would have had to get a scholarship. I would have had to stay at school and get a scholarship, which I didn't want to do. I wanted my independence. So I went and got a job in the city. It was about a, I don't know, a 45 minute train ride into the city. And I got a job. I had a couple of jobs, but the second one was with a patent attorney, you know, being a kind of um, stenographer, basically, shorthand and typing. But after a couple of years of that, I just was so bored. And so I decided to go and do nursing. So I went and signed up at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and um, three years later became a registered nurse. And- uh, uh, Have you any uh, prior interest in nursing? Like, did you play nurse with your sister or? Uh... I think we did like all little girls do. And you know, the only kind of options really were nursing and teaching and office right. work or factory work. And oh. so nursing was the standout for me. And, uh, and so that's why I went, but I was so shy and quiet and sort of terrified of, you know, I was a little country girl with no, mm -hmm. no city smarts or experience, you know, and, and, and so I was very shy and timid and it was quite an overwhelming environment, you know, with the strict ward sisters and the deference to the doctors and all of that kind of thing that went on. This was 1966 when I started. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, got my nursing uh, diploma and ended up going to Europe with a friend, Roseanne, or another nurse, and uh, we kind of went to Europe and I, we ended up getting separated and I, two years later, came back overland, you know, via um, Europe and India and Nepal and, uh, you know, wow. had quite a few adventures doing that. Took six months, lived in wow. Goa for a while with all the other hippies and that kind of thing. And, um, but while I was in England, I, 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 six months I was in England and I was doing agency work and I came across people who talked about their osteopaths and that kind of thing. And I sort of became aware that there was this other world of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I got back to Melbourne eventually and I was very, unsettled and didn't know what to do and I was just kind of doing agency nursing jobs and a friend of mine said oh we should go and see this guy who's um, a, a kind of a psychic and uh, his thing is you know telling people what what they're suited to do in life and um, so I went along to see him and you know we talked for a little while and he just kind of looked up vaguely into the ear around me and he said oh this one should be a naturopath Mm. And uh, and when he said it, this whole kind of feeling went through my body. It was the strangest thing. And um, my hair's standing on end now just thinking about it. And I kind of knew that was right. And I didn't, I thought, yeah, that's what I want to be. But what is it? <laughs> you know, I really, I really didn't know. And he said, here's a phone number of this man called Alf Jacker. He runs a college, so ring him up and um and enroll and so i did and i had to wait a few months for the next year's start start up date and i started naturopathy and that was 1972 no 73 i actually started yeah and um it was a little it was nighttime courses we went to this little old house in kew which they sort of set up as a college and we went three nights a week and we did some saturday mornings and we we had this weird and wonderful assortment of teachers <clears throat> and um, we studied, you know, nutrition and herbal medicine and um, some anatomy and physiology and, you know, basic biology and stuff like that. And we also did um, subjects in chiropractic and osteopathy. So I actually graduated after four years while I was doing it, they went from three years to four. So I graduated with a, diploma in naturopathy, one in chiropractic and one in osteopathy, which is a bit of a, a laugh now when you think about it. But um, so, I, you know, I combined. 
Did you know how to do manipulations and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. We had chiropractors no teaching us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I when I finally started to practice, you know, we did combine those things. It was like naturopathy was some um, um, nutritional medicine, herbal medicine, homeopathy, and physical stuff, massage and adjustment. So it was a very all round kind of approach. It was much more kind of generalist than it is now. So that was um, that was where it all started, and I went to my first job was a, a friend who'd graduated a few years before me, Kevin Ryan in Geelong, rang me up one day and said, "I've broken my wrist. Can you come down and work with me?" And I was, you know, basically at the end of my course in Melbourne, so I moved down there and went and worked with Kevin and worked with him for a couple of years and. Um, during that period of time became very interested in midwifery and home birth mm. uh, and um, decided uh, I would go back to Melbourne and enrol in midwifery course went and did that and, and went to the Queen Vic and did a year of homeopathy uh, sorry of midwifery and um, I, I chose that hospital because they were the only ones at the time who were interested in the Boyer method and a little bit more gentle respect for the birthing process. So mm -hmm. that's why I went there and did a year of midwifery. And then at the end of that, uh, there was a home birth midwife in Sydney called Edith Gosling. And um, she was pregnant with her fourth child, I think, and she needed help. She was nearly due. And um, so I went up there and expecting her to sort of go with me to a few home births. But but basically I was chucked in pretty soon because she was tired and she was nearly full term and she just needed to stop a bit, you know. So that was pretty um, nerve wracking. Uh, going How many to, births had you done up to that point in your training? Oh, I think we had to do, we had to do supervised 20 births on our own, apart from observing many more. Uh -huh. So I was pretty green. I mean, that was nothing really. And, uh, but anyway, luckily everything was okay and um, went uh, and stayed with her for about six months, I think it was. And then I ended up going to Cairns and um, while in my time with Edith, I'd met a lay midwife who was doing some training with her, who was from Cairns. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, come up and help us because there's a lot of people up there who want home births, but we need more training. So I went up there and I, I basically spent about a year working with that small group of about three lay midwives and teaching them what I knew, basically. And, uh, and then after that, I came back down to Melbourne and decided I wanted to go into practice and be a sort of naturopathic midwife. So I went into, I joined a group practice in Carlton in Melbourne and um, that's an inner city suburb of Melbourne and, yeah. and practiced as a naturopathic midwife and and linked up with um, Dr. John Stevenson a little bit, but mostly Peter Lucas, the doctor in Melbourne who was doing most of the home births and, you know, joined up with a group of home birth midwives there. So we became like a family, you know, a very supportive um midwives and doing you know home births around melbourne now how does being a naturopathic midwife differ from what the others were doing you providing? Well, basically um when people came to see me when uh pe pe mothers would come to the group at the midwives groups you know we ran kind of weekly sessions and mothers would come to that and from that they would get to know the midwives and they would choose somebody that they wanted to work with and um, so because I had the, um, the naturopathic background, some people chose me and they would come and see me in my rooms in Carlton and, and I would um, give them naturopathic um, supportive therapies through their pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So that consisted of things like acupuncture. I had also done a six-month course in acupuncture along wow. the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was not traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture. It was a kind of formula acupuncture that a European um, acupuncturist was teaching way back in the, that must have been near the early 70s. Um, 
nobody really was doing traditional Chinese medicine. Nobody really understood the theory at that point, but people were use, using formulas. You know, if you've got bronchitis, you use this, these points. You know, if, you, um, if you're having um, asthma attacks or whatever, you use these, you know, just, uh, you know, whatever. Formulas for all kinds of um, disorders including disorders of pregnancy. So um, that was what I did. Um, what was the name of the English uh, acupuncturist? I'm wondering if that's the same, there was a... Was he was not English, no, he was European. His name was Frank Heggy, H-E-G-Y-I. Oh, okay. He so, died quite a long time ago. Uh, back in the 70s, a, a group in uh, Columbia, Maryland, where I lived, it was, I think his name was Worsley, Wars, that was big in the States, a similar kind of probably a formula based. Uh, yeah. School. But so yeah. all these skills, I mean, I had no idea you were, and then uh, you were teaching aromatherapy at RMIT. Did, did that come in at that stage or was that later? Yeah, I have to think so much did happen. So that, so we're kind of up, up into the, the 80s and um, I just, just, I had about 10 years of home birthing and I was tired. It was, you know, you had to be on 110% alert mm -hmm. with a labouring woman at home. And um, and I, it would take me days to recover from a, attending a home birth because you couldn't knock off after eight hours. You know, you just stayed until it was done. And, um, and sometimes there were transfers to hospital um, mainly for failure to progress once for a retained placenta that I remember and things like that. So there was, um, you know, I was lucky. None of my clients ever had babies that died or, you know, anything terrible happened to them. But it, but it was the responsibility weighs really heavily on you. And oh, yeah. sometimes there were doctors present and sometimes there weren't, you know, depending on where you were at the time. And, um, you know what part of Australia or whatever. So anyway, in the end, I decided I I just could I needed a break from it, and I decided to go and live in Nimbin because I one of my clients, Heidi, my home birth client, she moved up here and she said, "Come and stay up with us and come and live up here for a while and see if you like it." Um. So so I went and lived just outside Nimbin. That was um about 1985 or something like that. And I started kind of coming and going from there and eventually I bought um, a place up there. And uh, then in one of my trips back down to Melbourne, I, um, I met uh, a guy who became my first husband. We got married in 1986 and we both moved up there together. Mm. And, but that marriage didn't last, only, only lasted about four years. So um, it wasn't really a happy time. But after that, Anyway, during that time, I met Diana Roberts, who was a herbalist in Nimbin, and we decided to go into practice together in Nimbin, uh, which we did. She was a herbalist and I was a naturopath, but hardly any clients came because they didn't have the money, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to um, go and see naturopaths or herbalists. So we decided what the best thing to do was, was to open up an apothecary on the main street of Nimbin and make out services because a lot of stuff people wanted was just, you know, a herb for this or uh, something for their diarrhea or, you know, their cold or whatever. And stuff, a lot of that stuff you can just, doesn't really need an hour consultation. So that's what we did. We opened the Nimbin Apothecary and that was about 1990. Mm. And... Um, Is that still going? Yeah, it's still going. Uh, you know, I was... I was there for five years and in that time I decided to, I, to, I started writing a few um, articles and I wrote a, um, an elective for Southern Cross University called Introduction to Natural Therapies and it was the most popular elective in the university for quite a few years. And um, that, so... That means you taught it as well as you uh, wrote it? Um, I think I did. I can't remember. It was a while ago. I must have. But anyway, on the strength, yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I did. On the strength of that, I decided to do a master's degree because there was some University of Western Sydney 
had a policy at the time of trying to support natural therapists like me to get further qualifications to go into higher education. So they were very supportive and there was a group of us from the Northern Rivers area who did that masters. It was um, a public health masters. And, uh, you know, we pretty much had free reign to do what we wanted. And so my, so it was, it was 50% coursework and 50 research. And for my research project, I did, I decided to interview a group of natural therapists, five women who, to ask them what their understanding of the healing process was, you know, from their perspective. So one was an acupuncturist, one was Judy Jacker, the naturopath. Um, um, I can't remember who they all were now, but anyway, I just came up with a, sort of, with a sort of basic theory about the healing process according to their experience of it as practitioners. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was my master's degree and I got my master's. And that was about 19... At the end of 94, my dad was sick in Melbourne. He just was not well and it was not clear what was wrong with him, but he was going downhill and I, I was going through a separation and divorce and I was just really tired. I'd been working in the apothecary and also doing some teaching in a naturopathy college up on the Gold Coast two days a week. So I'd go up there and stay overnight and I was trying to finish the master's degree and I was burned out, you mm -hmm. know, and working in the apothecary. And I thought, I just got to go back to Melbourne and, and just stop all of this madness. And I, I was at the point of writing up my thesis for my master's. So I went back to Melbourne and that was the end of 94. And um, wrote up my master's degree at home. And I went to live with mum and dad in Lara, which is just be between Geelong and Melbourne in Victoria. And, uh, and went back there and wrote up my thesis and um, spent six months with there with Jed and he just sort of suddenly died. You know, it was a kind of about a two week process. But um, anyway, after that, mum was really shattered. So I decided I should stay. I was, you know, again, a bit footloose and didn't know what to do with myself. And then I realized that I could apply for a PhD scholarship with Southern Cross and my supervisor up there was um, Professor Bev Taylor in the School of Nursing. And the School of Nursing was very supportive. They were of natural therapies coming into nursing practice. And so they had quite a few kind of subjects and electives and people working there who had natural therapy backgrounds as well as nursing. And um, so they took me on, which was great. And um, so I... I thought, well, that takes care of my life for the next three years. I'll be, you know, I'll just stay here and do the PhD and look after mum and kind of see where it all takes me from there. Maybe I'll go back up to Nimbin and, you know, or the Northern Rivers area and maybe I won't. And um, Did you do this by uh, correspondence? This was before the internet. So or how did... Um, we had, no, it was 1995 and it was the early days of the internet. It was 19, when did I start the, um, I didn't start, it was the late 90s when I started the PhD, I think. Oh, so it was online more like we do now. Yeah, uh -huh. but it was pretty rudimentary, you know, um, but Bev would ring me once a week on the phone and we'd have about an hour's um, discussion on the phone about where I was up to and then I could email her chapters of my thesis and that sort of thing. And I was doing um, philosophy of natural medicine was my topic. And I was comparing, again, the kind of understanding of healing um, across naturopathy, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. Oh. So I chose 20 textbooks, you know, which was mammoth, considering a lot of people do a PhD on a poem. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it, it ended up, it was mammoth, and it ended up being two volumes of, uh, of thesis, you know. Um, and I kept saying to Bev, Bev, I think this is too big. And she said, oh, you just have to finish it when you finish it. But at the point came where she said, that's enough, you know. So, um, yeah, and uh, so that, but anyway, 
my, the three years wasn't enough and I had to keep get extending it. It eventually took me five years and around about the, the fourth year, I got a phone call from La Trobe University and it was the School of Nursing and they'd heard about me and they, the, the head of school there, Rhonda Ney, wanted to set up some kind of um, course for nurses in complementary therapies because they, you know, at that point there was quite a lot of interest in it in the nursing profession. And, you know, in the USA as well, you know, ahead of, it, of Australia, obviously, um, in integrating various natural therapies into nursing practice. So um, anyway, um, I went for an interview and Stephen Duckett was the Dean at the time of the School of Health Sciences and he was there. And, and I, was, I, I went to the interview and I was kind of totally amazed that these people were even interested in this whole process, you know, and we talked for an hour or so and uh, anyway, they rang me up later and said, you know, we'd like you to come and start and develop something, you know, you work out what you think it ought to be. So wow. I went there and started working casually about three days a week. I was still living with mum in Lara. And um, anyway, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, you know, I'd never really worked in a university. I'd done this casual stuff for Southern Cross, but I had never kind of really been a member of a faculty and I had to figure out how it all worked and it was pretty stressful and um, it was kind of left up to me and I'm thinking who do I answer to and who's my boss and you know uh, what do I do next and it was crazy and I was so ill prepared anyway somehow I someone suggested to me dear why don't you set up a working committee <laughs> So I went, oh, great, <laughs> that's what I'll do. So, you know, about three or four people from the School of Nursing joined me and we set up a working committee. And what was the outcome of that? What we all decided we should do was a double degree in nursing and naturopathy. So that was pretty groundbreaking. So um, I said about, I did, you know, most of the work and developed the curriculum for it. And, um, you know, it took us two years to get it through the approval process, you know, first through the school, then through the, um, the, um, the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, and then it had to go up, you know, and basically get a, the final stamp of approval at university level. So that is, you know, was um, a crash course for me. And in the middle of all of that, Rhonda Ney decided to advertise a position as senior lecturer, you know, in naturopathy in the School of Nursing. So I had to apply for it and several other people applied for it. And um, I had to, you know, go to an interview with a panel. And anyway, um, after the interview was over, you know, an hour later, she came and knocked on my door and said, you got the job. She said, there was, you know, there was nobody else really could touch you, you in terms of, you know, what experience you have. And, um, and I was pretty gobsmacked, really, and pretty amazed. And then I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? <laughs> you know, senior lecturer is a is significant position in a school. And, um, and I was, you know, pretty overwhelmed by it all, really. Anyway... I staggered along, um, the course got approved, we got the first cohort of students came in around about 2000 and nine months into that, okay, it was around about October, uh, well no, mid-year, Rhonda Ney kind of stepped sideways and we got a new head of the School of Nursing, a guy called Alan Pearson. So he was the new head of school and in October he said we're going to have a whole of school retreat um, at this place in northern Victoria and we all went up there you know and we, we have we're doing this whole day retreat and then he says you know early on in the piece the school of nursing is in the red we're going to have to cut some courses out of the um, we can't afford to run them all we've got too many courses and just a red flag went ding up in my head straight away and um, I knew what was coming and um, and he said, he reeled off a list of courses and of course the double degree in nursing and naturopathy was one of them. And um, he said at the time also, this course doesn't align with my philosophy, oh. um, apart, apart from the fact that we can't um, afford it. We, you know, we were so early into the course and they didn't want to set up all the clinical side of it would have had to be set up, you know, to, clinical experiences for the students and all of that. So we're in year one of the first cohort when this happened. 
and um, quite a few of the other people in the School of Nursing came to me um, in a break and said, did you know this was happening? Did he talk to you about this? And I said, no. And they were angry about the process. You know, I think some of them probably agreed with it going, but they were not not happy with how he was going about it. So in the next day, I sat up half the night kind of writing a, um, a defence and read all of that out at the next day. And then um, the school voted and they voted to keep it. Wow. But um, one of the more senior, um, other senior lecturers in the school came to me afterwards and said, that means nothing. He'll just go about it another way and he'll find another way to get rid of it, you know, which is exactly what he did. Mm. He basically went to the dean and said, look, we just can't afford it. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what the school wanted to keep it. Um, he said, we're going to teach it out. So... Um, by that time, it's near, it's the end of the year, and the second cohort had come in, you know, had had um, applied through the, the system that you know, well, I forget the acronym for it, VTAC or something, you know, the the uh, so the second cohort had to come in the next year, so they were there, and and I had to set about deciding how are we going to teach this this out they wanted me to teach it all out right they wanted me to teach all the nutrition all the the, the um the herbal medicine every course basically except for the sciences you know that and i just said no no i'm not doing that and um Fortunately, by the time this all happened, there was a, a private college, the Southern School of Natural Therapies in Melbourne, that had um, been uh, accredited to offer a bachelor degree in naturopathy. So I went to see the principal there, who I knew, Colin Thompson, and uh, and said, you know, would he be open to taking this cohort of students? So he was open to it. And I put him and our new head of school, who Alan Pearson had left by that time. So he came in, did all the damage and then left. We had a, a new head of school, um, a woman, her name will come back to me, Eva, I think. Anyway, um, she was much more compassionate. And she and Colin Thompson, you know, had talks and she went to inspect the school and, you know, she was happy with it all. So I had then the task of completely rejigging the curriculum because we had all the nursing and naturopathy subjects being taught side by side for five years. So I had to rejig it all so that it was um, the nursing stuff could all be taught first and then they would do two years at the Southern School to do the naturopathy subjects. Mm. So, um, and then I had a full load of nursing teaching as well as a senior lecturer. So I nearly went mad, you know, in that semester when I had to to do all of that, you know, resub, you know, rework the curriculum, resubmit it through the the school of nursing, etc., and break all the news to these students that what was going to happen to them and. Um, so it was a really, really tough time. You know, it, it really affected my health in a lot of ways. It was hard. Um, and when all of that was done, um, at, at the same time I was doing some research with the School of Public Health um, and it was um, looking into the regulation of natural naturopathy and herbal medicine in Victoria. And uh, with Vivian Lin, Professor Vivian Lin was the head of of the School of Public Health at La Trobe. Um, so um, because I'd already started that process and and um, I ended up kind of managing that project and and met all these really wonderful people like Mark Cohen and uh, Alan Ben Susan and Anne Louise Carlton and um, Stephen um, Stephen from Myers from Southern Cross University and you know they were all on this in this team of people doing this research. So finally, you know, I staggered across the finish line at the School of Nursing and said, uh, I'm resigning and I'm going to um, move over to the School of Public Health. And through all of that process, also the union got involved. I got them involved, you know, in my situation with what was happening, because the School of Nursing wanted me to become a senior lecturer in nursing. Okay, and I had, or, you know, I was finishing, <laughs> it was a crazy time, I was working full time at in the School of Nursing. Um, at the weekend, I'd go down to mum um, 
and help her with all the stuff she needed to, to do around the house on Saturday. Then on Sunday, I'd spend on my PhD and then I'd go back to Melbourne and, you know, start again. And, I, you know, it was just so exhausting. Anyway, I got my PhD. And finally, I was able to leave the School of Nursing. I got a payout through the union and I moved over to the School of Public Health and it was really... I was shattered, but I was only working three days a week and I and Vivian Lynn gave me a lot of sort of scope to just quietly manage all this group of people. I did three research projects myself as part of that whole study and then there was all the other people were, were also doing research projects. So I was kind of coordinating um, all of that. And, um, and finally in 2005 the report was released it was funded by the department of human health and services in victoria and we released that report and the recommendation was that naturopathy and herbal medicine should be registered professions mm. okay this was 2005 oh i turned you off <laughs> Sorry, I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, off, power off. off. <laughs> I'm sorry. A musical interlude there. Ah, anyway. So. Um, okay. That sounds like uh, you had a lot to do with that. Uh, I did, yeah. The, legit, uh, the licensure and the. Yeah, yeah wow. I did. Yeah, and also in that in that period of time, I was also doing voluntary work with the Chinese Medicine Registration Board in Victoria. So I got a lot to see how the registration process worked, oh, okay. you know, and what was involved and seeing it in action when there were complaints made against practitioners and being on panels, you know, at, um, um, uh, when those practitioners, it was like a little court. Um, mm that the, I forget the name of the, the Chinese Medicine Registration Board anyway was at that time. Yeah, so I got I got to have a lot to do with that. And I wrote quite a few, I wrote a policy for the Nursing Registration Board in Victoria on the use of complementary therapies in nursing practice. So I was quite involved in all of that kind of side of things at the time. Um, so anyway, the, re the report finally came out and then I, I really had no work and it was like, that was about 2006 and I just stayed at home and started my recovery process really, you know, from all the burnout and... Um, yeah, I got tired listening to all of it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was hard and anyway, I did some... I did some um, course writing I wrote from home I wrote one for the Royal College of Nursing on you know complementary therapies in nursing practice but in the course of that year at home Mark rang me up Mark Cohen and said hey I'm um, going to do a, a, a postgraduate course in um, wellness at RMIT I'm going to write it and, and design it would you like to come and help and I thought oh that sounds great so that was I think about 2007, I went over there and joined Mark and um, it was great because it was only like about a 15 minute drive from my home and it was a nice little kind of outer suburban campus with lakes and duck ponds and gardens and it was a small campus and there was a school of nursing there and there was osteopathy, chiropractic and Chinese medicine as well as, um, as the wellness course. Yeah. I want to pause so, for a minute because uh, this was where we we meet and and uh, connected. Yes. There are a couple of things you said earlier uh, that I that got my curiosity peaked. And one was when you were coming back from Europe overland, and you mentioned hippies. And it sounds like you might have been sort of a a, a hippie wannabe like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, I, how did that's that true. Influence? <laughs> where, Sorry, Jack. Uh, w w did you actually become a hippie? Would, did you uh, let your hair grow and run naked through the forest? Or? I, sort of, you know, I'm a, a kind of conservative person by nature, but, but I'm also, I wasn't happy with the mainstream of healthcare and I liked the alternative culture, you know, I liked being a part of it and, you know, and, and being a into herbal medicine and naturopathy and those kind of things in those years just yeah. automatically put you in that category. That's where that's where you found yourself. And um, 
And yeah, so I, I was interested in all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, 94, when I was, you know, um, finishing off the master's degree and my marriage had broken up and, and Nimbin had changed, you know, it wasn't the happy-go-lucky hippie place it used to be and there was a lot of heroin on the streets and that kind of thing and overdoses happening and mm. feral people and fights on the street. And, you know, I was kind of happy to leave in many ways. So I kind of thought of myself as a failed hippie <laughs> at that point in time and, yeah, went back into the mainstream with the, you know, the academic work and, um, and that kind of stuff. But I, I kind of tra straddled those two worlds yeah. really all along the way. Well, for our like viewers, you did in many ways. Uh, for viewers who don't know that Nimbin is the uh, the marijuana uh, capital of Australia, they have an annual Mardi Gras uh, yeah. celebration. <laughs> I live near there and and pick up on it. I've visited it a few times. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, and actually, when in 1980, Marin and I were looking for a place to move. We went to Nimbin and we, mm. we were interested in a community and we met someone that uh, visited a community there. So um, that was in its early days. Yeah. We wound up in Costa Rica ultimately, but having mm. checked out New Zealand and Fiji. The other thing I wanted to ask about was the uh, atmosphere, the climate for home birth when you were in Melbourne and because the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, resistance in the U.S. was yeah. incredible and, and, yeah. and it's gotten worse. Uh, the doctors yeah. who were supporting midwives would lose their insurance and, you know, uh, what was it like for you there? It was hard um, because the mainstream um, of uh, obstetrics um, and midwifery were dead against home birth. Um, a supportive atmosphere in some ways like we would get media people who would ring us up and say you know can we do an interview with you and they would write fairly supportive kind of stories because there were so many women who were reporting horrible experiences in hospitals and they were desperate to not repeat that and so there was a you know a bit of sympathy in some sections of the media with the home birth movement mm -hmm. and um and also, you know, there were these, uh, there were these, in Melbourne, two doctors who would go to home births at that point in time. And so they took a lot of the heat, really. And, and they were both subjected to um, complaints and, and um, um, having to go to um, justify themselves to the medical board in Victoria and that kind of thing on a regular sort of basis. Um, and I think in the end, John Stevenson was, I don't know whether he was deregistered or just stopped from doing home births. Um, and Peter Lucas also um, had quite a lot of problems with the medical board. So it was, it was frightening. And I mean, that was part of the whole stretch, you know, that I talked about earlier of being a home birth and midwife and um, the responsibility of it and that, you know, the being on alert 110% for anything that could go wrong. Um, but at the same time, wanting so much for those mothers and babies to have, you know, um, a, a gentle and soft experience as, you know, as much as it can be. I think, you know, birth for mothers and babies is, you know, fairly traumatic, but <clears throat> in lots of ways. But a part of my experience with it was I realized intuitively that women that that the production of sound in labor by laboring women um could help them mm -hmm. and if they could find their voice and um and kind of sound in like chat like a chant even if it was just oh 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 not words just oh mm -hmm. kind of full body powerful sound as they were having contractions um, w was helpful and uh, more, much more helpful in the breathing mm. techniques that we were originally taught. And so I would teach women how to do it. And, um, and I, you know, so many of them found it a wonderful and liberating kind of experience and said amazing things about it. And um, so... I had, 
you know, it, it, it encouraged me to keep going really, you know, to that, that it was, that it was possible to have a natural birth and there were ways to do it. Not everybody could do it, um, but you know, you could find ways and it was, you know, through breathing and sound and movement and positioning and use of, you know, water, hydrotherapy, hot baths, aromatherapy, music. It was just combining all of these things and letting women choose, you know, from all of that array of things you could offer to find a way through for them to have this baby and bring this baby into the world. So um, I think I probably attended about 100 home births over those years, which was not a lot. You know, some home birth midwives did a lot more than that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I felt deep down my role was to protect, protect the babies. That was my, the heart of it for me, as best I could. And sometimes that meant going to hospital. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's been painful for all of the home birth midwives over the, you know, we're talking about the 1980s and 90s. And I, since then, you know, the movement for women to have obstetricians has grown much more. And the control of home birth got tighter and tighter. We had birth centres for quite a while and one after another they closed down because hospitals said, oh, we will provide birthing centres in our labour wards. Um, but I think more mainstream midwives gradually, what get, gives me heart now is that the research that's going on in midwifery schools in the universities now, and I think there's a lot more willingness um, in midwifery to understand the natural birthing process. I think it's still very hard for them to you know, to, to have the obstetricians loosen their grip a little bit. Um, it's still an ongoing struggle, but, um, uh, you know, I think I just read the, I just heard this young woman on the radio the other day saying she had come across, she sounded so surprised, women who'd been traumatised by their birthing process, you know, in recent times I'm talking about, and she was, amazed at this and said, why aren't people talking about this? And I'm listening to this thinking, oh my God, you know, young women are, are just discovering that, you know, they're being traumatised by the birthing process in hospitals. It's just, and, the, and somebody said, this could be the start of a whole new kind of Me Too movement, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, exactly. when will this ever change? Yeah. Mm. All that, all that, experience of the home birth midwives the older ones has just kind of slowly being lost because the whole years ago and that made a lot of them stop practicing and consequently on that we ended up with a lot of um, free birthing starting to happen. Uh, you... I, I lost you there for a few minutes. Um, yeah. uh, uh, it may, um, may have recorded but did you say pre-birthing? Free birthing, women free -birthing. are deciding. Oh, yeah. Free birthing, yeah, is the, this has been the outcome. There's been, you know, a small number of women every year who just decide they'll go down by themselves and have their baby on the beach because if they can't, they can't get a, a home birth midwife. So that's been happening. And also the doulas, the rise of doulas, which has been a good thing, which are kind of lay, lay women who support become a support person and will go with you into hospital, you know, when you wow. have your baby, but um, they, they're not midwives. They can't actually do anything except, you know, the physical kind of and, and emotional support things they can offer. Mm. I've, I've not heard of free birthing in, on beaches at, uh, in, in people's homes, yes, but uh, that's, a, that's a new phenomenon to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's probably a fairly rare example, but yeah, you're right. Free birthing does mainly happen at home without a midwife, but basically, it means you know having nobody there with any obstetrical midwifery experience. Yeah. Mm. Oh wow! Mm. Um, so I'm um, my curiosity has been 
slate of uh, <coughs> those uh, pieces. So let's uh, <clears throat> jump back up to um, your uh, Mark recruiting you to RMIT and the beginning of the program, which was how I met you when I was later mm -hmm. recruited. So you were really uh, Mark's uh, uh, left, he was your left hand man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was just the two of you to start out with, and then you brought in. Uh, uh, um, no, there was also another another guy there called Stephen Penman, oh, and yeah. uh, remember Stephen? And I think Stephen had done written written one or two courses as mm -hmm. well. So there was first there was Mark, and then Stephen came board, and then on board, and then me. And that, that was in all the development pro process, you know. First, we had that retreat. Uh, yeah. A couple did you of, start? Do you, do you mean you started teaching or writing writing your course, Jack? Uh, teaching because Mark had already written the course. That's right. I he inherited had, this, yeah. this monster course of yeah. half of which had no interest for me. And thank heaven yeah. for Damien to yeah. take over. Uh, and I had to warm it up by introducing a general theory of love as the textbook, which made it far less dry and boring. But mm -hmm. I think that well, I wasn't on the first teaching year, which was either 2007 or eight. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, how, what was the process of gathering the other uh, faculty? Because I was one of the later ones to come in, I think. Well, I think because we, we started just by offering the kind of early introductory subjects. And then as the students progressed, you know, more subjects had to become available and more teachers to teach them. So it just kind of, kind of grew like that from from my recollection. Um, Lisa Oates came on board. She, um, she was doing her PhD originally with Mark and then she got that and, and she kind of took over from me. Um, we had Bob, what was Bob's surname? You know Bob. Um, oh, boy. Who yeah, he came in. the corporate wellness um, yeah. came on board. Eva Migdell, who did the wellness coaching. Um, so yeah, so eventually we were quite a team of people, which was great. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. We had those yeah. those retreats to build yeah. our team. Simon Borg Olivia, who did the yoga. Imagine yeah. an online yoga course. They managed to do that. Yeah. But. Um, we had like a couple of retreats and, yes. and we had the one outside of Melbourne and the uh, that, mm. uh, place up in the hills. And mm. then the funding disappeared when, uh, what, yep. what was the guy's name of uh, Mark's boss that uh, was so supportive that that got replaced by the, be the bean counter and then everything went downhill. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had the guy, I can't remember whose name, who was the head of the faculty. He, he had a psychology background, so he was quite a bit, he was quite supportive of Mark and the course. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think anyway, eventually Charlie Schwer became the head of school and Charlie had been the head of the Chinese medicine program in, in the faculty. Um, and at that point when he took over this, uh, you know, the same old story, the school was in the red and quite a few of the courses had to go. There were too many things going on. So we, Oh, but also um, at the same time, there was a national um, pulling into line of master's degree so that the whole, the, some Australian education body, um, peak education body decided that all master's degrees had to be two years full time. And ours was 18 months. So um, we had the choice of either writing another six months um, to make it full time or cutting it back to become a grad dip. And because the school wasn't supportive of extending it to be a two years full time, it was decided to pull it back and just make it a grad dip wellness. So that's what happened. So that was one year full time. For, uh, for Americans, uh, grad dip means graduate diploma. Uh, yes. There's a, a whole different lingo I had to learn. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and uh, 
Uh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, we had uh, a lot of courses. Uh, I don't, uh, mine started out with only five or six and eventually crept up to uh, mm -hmm. 15 or 20 or 30 starting out. Uh, but when uh, it was all done online with um, Blackboard, an older version of Blackboard, because they were too chintzy to buy the latest version for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And when I, uh, that was around the time that I concluded that the currency of wellness was connection. And we had no physical contact. We had no verbal contact no visual contact. It was all done by email. And I said, what's mm -hmm. wrong with this picture? It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I had, I had Im imagined teaching being a, a noble profession and uh, stimulating and intellectually and so forth. And mm -hmm. it turned out for me doing this course to be a proctor, basically. <laughs> Very yeah. unrewarding. Um, yeah. you'd, you'd had prior teaching experience and, uh, so it was it was a hard one for me to uh, mm. get my head around, um, mm. but it was at one point the only masters in wellness in the world. Maybe still was the only one. Uh, there was another one in the USA, um, and oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It was run. It, I, I actually went over there. I went at one stage to New York and went to this small university and. Oh, I met the woman who ran it. Her name was Leslie something. I'm sorry, my memory is so hazy. It might come back to me. Um, but she was sort of virtually running this um, Master of... I don't, I don't think they called it a Master of Wellness. They called it something else. But she was virtually running it single-handedly. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was more like um, a slight twist on a health promotion kind of course mm -hmm. or program. And... Um, there was no natural therapies in it or anything like that you know things that natural therapies that could be used to enhance wellness there was nothing much like that in it and um but that was the only other one that yeah, i was even heard of that. So yeah. we had a, a pretty broad base there for uh, those first years and uh, mm. but um, we did have a couple of student retreats um there was one up in i don't know whether you came to any of those jack um, and so not many students could come because of the cost, but but um, we had several of them and we met some of our students that way, which was great. Yeah, I, I came to uh, maybe two, at least one. I remember the place mm -hmm. and I remember you were there. Mm -hmm. It was out in the woods uh, up uh, yeah. Maryville before the fires, I think. Um, I can't remember. I remember one, wasn't one in New South Wales somewhere? Were they all in Victoria? The only one I went to was outside of Melbourne up in, the, I know we, we took the, the end of the train line uh, out um, Lilydale line, I think it was, and then there was a bus, but uh, some of us carpooled and it was yeah. quite an operation to get there. Um, yeah. But it was fascinating, the, the students that we met there was another one uh, that was done afterwards uh, at the end of the year. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think I went to two of them. Um, yeah, they were the, the good old days. <laughs> yeah, and I think the best decision that Mark made, or one of the best, was not to restrict the, um, the students to people who already had some kind of health um, degree. Mm -hmm. in a health area, you know, he put it wide open so that anybody who had a bachelor degree, you know, in any discipline could come and do the Master of Wellness because he wanted it to be spread out. Mm -hmm. He wanted the wellness message to get out broadly into the community. And, and so we had, you know, an amazing range of, you know, people from all kinds of backgrounds and it was really good. And all over the planet, we had yeah. uh, people in Asia, people in yeah. Europe and yeah. I don't remember any Americans in my classes. Mm. Strange. No, I don't think we did. I'm just remembering when we first met, we went for a walk up uh, along the Yarra River in that park and we saw we, did. we saw a platypus in the river. We weren't did sure we? of it. Oh. Uh, and I talked to my uh, cousin who was a biologist and she confirmed that it would have been a platypus. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember you ringing me up and um, 
you saying to me, you know, that you just joined the course and you'd like to meet me. And I thought, oh gosh, this famous man wants to meet me. And yeah, what am I going to say, you know? <laughs> and then I met you and you were just sort of very kind and warm and, well, and humble and generous with your time and just generally interested in people and life. So it was well, very nice to meet you that way, Jack. My fame is somewhat... Uh marginal in certain areas <laughs> hasn't done me a whole lot of good yeah i know what you mean you know it's the story of our lives in the whole kind of counterculture really you know yeah. in so many ways well just trying to just trying to keep an alternative message out there and keep it alive and, yeah mm. so then uh, as things wound down you retired and uh, uh you were working part-time from home i think because Mark could never have done it without you with my picture. Like Mark's the figurehead, but Pauline's really running the show. Yeah. It seemed like. And then yeah. uh uh Liza Lisa, I always want to Lisa. Uh, I'm getting a message. My internet is unstable, but uh went away. Mm. Uh, you were you were really the workhorse as I could see. <laughs> then you phased yourself out gradually and mm. as it wound down. But now what are your uh your ambitions now in terms of uh, uh, you're pretty much retired but uh, still interested? Yeah, well, I, like you say, I gradually wound down and I, I, I in the last couple of years I was just doing some online marking in um, the subjects that I originally wrote and, uh, for, and Lisa took over. Mm -hmm. um, no, I ended up just marking in her subject, which was Introduction to Food as Medicine, which was a really fun one to work in. And so I finished my last one um, last year, in the middle of the year, that was the end, and, and, I, and I left RMIT and I retired. But since for about the last five or six years, I've been on the board of the Jacka Foundation. I don't know if you were aware of that, Jack, no, but it's... Okay. Um, yeah, um, and we give money for research in natural therapies, and most of our money goes to um, Nickham at University of Western Sydney, but also to um, UTS in also in Sydney, because um, both of those universities have um, uh, some kind of program or institute in place or whatever to research natural medicine and or, or, and or the, the the professions. So. Um, so in a way that was my way oh can i tell you the story of how that foundation came into being it's not yeah, too curious long. i never heard of it i mentioned the southern school of natural therapies that was where i did my naturopathy you know many years ago eventually that college got sold in about 2010 because um, there were these big international education conglomerates like seek and think and laureate that moved in and, and they took over a lot of, they bought out a lot of small colleges, not just natural therapies, but beauty therapy and hairdressing and design and all those kind of things. Um, and anyway, the, the headmaster, the, the principal of the Southern School at the time felt that there was too much competition and pressure and that the school should be sold. So it was sold. And, um, but in the end, the Southern School owned the building it was in, which was a big four-storey old big building in Fitzroy, which is a kind of um, hip inner suburb of Melbourne. Yeah. And um, so in the process of selling, um, the Southern School, um, again, a bit of backstory, had become a not-for-profit organisation. So it had a council, a school council, and it was decided that when the Southern School changed hands, it would be the education part of the business would be sold, but the building would be retained. Okay, and and the building would be handed over to the council, which would be turned into a foundation. Okay, so that became the council became the Jacker Foundation of Natural Therapies, and it owned the building and. Um, Laureate, who now owns Southern School, pay rent to the Jacker Foundation for the well, you know to, to be in the building. Uh -huh. So um, so it's quite a significant amount of money that comes in every year, and um, so um, so the foundation was formed in 2010, 
and uh, they invited me to come on board um, about, like I said, five or six years ago. So, um, so I became a philanthropist in my old age, oh, which has been oh. fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and not even your own money <laughs> no I know how, how lucky is that and um, yeah so so we just have this steady stream of income we don't have to fundraise you know like a lot of foundations spend 90 percent of their time fundraising mm -hmm. it's really hard work and we don't have to do that or well, we didn't but but we're now trying to apply for um, deductible gift recipient status, which means that people who donate to us can don't have to be to pay tax on their donations. So we're in the process of applying for that. And part of that process is we do have to um, demonstrate that we are actively fundraising, not just passively taking money in. So we are now having to start thinking about fundraising. So um, it's an interesting time. So you're reviewing proposals for our grant, our grant applications, basically from from individuals or uh, departments? Or? Uh, no, we decided we couldn't. We talked about scholarships originally and and funding, you know, various research projects. But we thought we didn't have the time or the expertise to individually go through what could could potentially be hundreds of applications, you know, coming in for because research funding for natural therapies is so hard to get. So we thought our best way is to work with universities who are already doing that. So um, University of Western Sydney has NICOM, which is the National Institute of Complementary Medicine. And um, they have a big, they're an institute, they're a standalone institute, and they do research on all kinds of different therapies, um, uh, Chinese medicine, you know, herbs and acupuncture. Um, they've started a stream of research in cannabis. Um, so, you know, they do a range of things and they've got people with all kinds, their researchers have all kinds of different backgrounds, including medicine, um, naturopathy, Chinese medicine, midwifery. Um, so they're quite a big institute. And um, the other one, University UTS in Sydney, they have um, a centre called Australian Research Centre for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. And they run quite a lot of stuff, but they have a more public health approach and they're looking at the professions particularly, but they, we fund a research mentoring program there. So they have about, uh, I think about a dozen research fellows from around the world um, who come there for a residential one week every year and they all have access to lots of different databases and they get together and they, they plan research papers and they support each other. And they, they, um, they originally they were mentored by staff at Arkham in that centre. But now after about four years we've been doing this, they have, they have pumped out like over a hundred now research publications. Okay, so they're now really into the swing of it and they are, they are writing all the time and working collaboratively and mentoring each other and it's just kind of taken on a life of its own. So that's been a very rewarding thing to fund as well. And we've had, a, we've had about three people just came to us, you know, by various channels wanting postgraduate scholarships. So we're, we've been funding three PhD scholarships as well. Mm. Yeah. No idea you had this other life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um it's been lovely. It was a gift to me to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah, and a gift to the mm. to the world. Now, well, you know, partly because it's been so hard to get bachelor degrees, there's been a whole move against. There's a group called Friends of Science in Medicine in Australia that were formed about eight ten years ago, and they made it their mission to get natural therapies out of universities. Yeah, okay, like and they were fairly research. successful. They were successful in lots of ways. So um, for naturopaths and herbalists who are doing their bachelor degrees in private colleges, there's no pathway for them into, you know, uh, honours and uh, masters and PhDs and that whole kind of pathway you normally get in universities was very hard for them to access. So by um, funding these two universities and their programs, it's, it's also ways for people to um, get um, access to scholarships and to research experience um, 
researching natural therapies to become experienced researchers, you know, which is um, a very important for our um, professional community. So, you know, that's one of our main aims is just to grow the numbers of people in naturopathy and herbal medicine who have PhDs and who have, you know, who are gaining more and more research expertise. Yeah. Wow, it's quite a professional uh, path you've, uh, career mm -hmm. you've made. I'm, I'm, uh, I'd am like to wrap up with a, a little of your um, personal life. You've just left the, the big city, although you were out in a, a beautiful area. I remember visiting you there. Yeah. Uh, but now you're down by the seashore and uh, uh, spending a lot more time in nature, I assume. And uh, oh, Yeah, I sure am. Well, in the middle of the corona pandemic now and um, uh, the, you know going for walks down along the beach is just fabulous to be able to do that because yeah I only left Melbourne in January so um, three months ago um, and it would have been a lot harder there to get out and I mean Montmorency was a nice area you know, it was an outer suburb of Melbourne and it was quite a hilly and treed area as you remember and mm -hmm. it, it was a very attractive place to live um, but the sea um, has you know holds more magic and mystery for me so I'm lucky to be able to at least walk along there every day mm. Mm -hmm. but yeah wellness um I loved your currency of wellness is connection Jack and we're certainly being challenged with that now and um, having to isolate so much and yeah it's great to be able to talk to you finding new forms of connection that yes Mm -hmm. All of the organizations I'm involved with have switched over to Zoom connections and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, a, a big uh, transition that uh, yeah. those viewers who uh, see this down the line will, will know what the outcome is, but we're in a, a state of, oh my God, what's, what's next and uh, how will this play out? The, uh, yeah. the economy's crashing and so many people out of work what uh what will come of it um it's a, yes I, but i think in many ways it's making us appreciate community in our local areas more and, yes. uh, and you know and having to to get together and support each other in ways that we kind of didn't need to before because we were we had home life we had our friends we had the internet we had you know work and all of those things that kind of kept us connected but now it's a very different we're really having to come to terms with what living alone or living you know in an isolated situation really means mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what do you see your future being like uh you're gonna find your ideal spot uh mm -hmm. to buy a house and uh yeah and, uh, i don't know this situation has thrown everything up in the air i, I don't know would uh, you gonna take up surfing or? Ah, oh, well, the water, you know, there's no surf here because where I am is on the Bellarine Peninsula, which sticks out into the middle of Port Phillip Bay. Right. You know, Melbourne's at the head of the bay and this peninsula kind of sticks out. So it's not an ocean beach, it's a quiet. And I love it because it's often, often the water is dead calm and you can just swim without being bounced around by all the waves, you know, and I do like to swim. So um, I, I do like it. But, yeah, just being on the water, you know, if I could find, if I can live close to the water and, you know, I'd like a kayak or something like that, you know, that enables me to get out a little bit further on the water without having to tow a boat or lug it's a heavy thing mm -hmm. across the sand, you know, I'll, I'll find a way to do that. So, um, so yeah, and, and hopefully a bit more travel and catching up with people um, in the future. You know, all of our plans to do that have gone on hold for the time being. Seeing more of Australia, mm -hmm. probably not so much overseas travel anymore. I don't think it's a bit arduous, as you know, from yeah. Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, any other parting words for future generations uh, interested in the pioneers in wellness? That we oh, I just hope, Jack, that more people in the mainstream, you know, become aware of wellness. You know, when I look back on my life, it's like 
40 odd years of being involved in natural therapies and it's changed so much you know how how pushed off to the side we were as naturopaths we were irrelevant you know to the mainstream um, when I started but now there's so much more awareness I think there's still a big pushback trying to keep it out of the mainstream but now we've got things like the Integrated Medicine Association and you know the midwives doing research on natural birth and and, and all these areas where it, it's still alive and, and it, it's kind of it's it's there much more you know all this awareness of natural stuff is there much more but there's still this huge effort to keep it out of the mainstream Big and, you know, behind it i think yeah and even now with the coronavirus all the emphasis is on um social distancing and hand washing and all of that which is great but where's the public health message on vitamin d and vitamin c and zinc supplements and things that are proven you know to help the immune system but none of that is there in the mainstream public health and medical messaging and i just think that's a bit of a public health crime in a way you know that that people are having to find out this information that there are things that they can do um, to help themselves, you know, apart from just hand washing and distancing and stuff. And so, you know, luckily we've, there's a lot of information on the internet, but, you know, our government, a TGA, are saying to people, you know, natural therapies are a waste of money and there's no evidence for all of that stuff, which is so not true. And that I find disheartening, you know, that no. those people in positions of power are still um, unwilling to let it in even when there's good evidence you know 10 years ago they were saying oh there's only one kind of evidence based medicine and that is medicine with evidence and if it's got good evidence we'll use it but they don't they still don't want to know about it there's still a bias against you know using things like iv vitamin c for infection and stuff like that that yeah, oh well a big pharma uh, if, if there's not a lot of bucks behind it yeah, pharma doesn't want to hear about it, and uh, no, and politicians are all in the in the uh, mm. pockets of the of big pharma. So, well, they just take advice. You know, most of them have no health education or medical education, and they just take the advice that they're given. What else can they do, really? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, but well, you know, a, we live in like <laughs> to uh, get to know more about your past. A, a lot of things I didn't know. I, uh, respected you from afar and what I've <clears throat> seen you could do and now I have a better understanding of why and how you have done all the wonderful things you've done so, so. thank you Jack and likewise you know you've done so much too for the whole wellness area and spreading the message around the world and it's such an important message yeah thank well, you we're uh, we're collectively hoping to get it out uh, yeah for future generations so thank yeah. you again thank you jack goodbye and stay well